to see us cover. Um, so it's just like today's session uh, is covering a theme of early evolution. We've been covering a range of different themes. For example, last seminar's topic was messy systems. We've covered protocells, um, mineral evolution is another example. And we would like to invite you to send us your recommendations and preferences for specific science themes that fall within the overarching fields of prebiotic chemistry and early earth environments. So today, as you're listening to these talks, if any um, specific ideas come to mind, we're asking that um, at the end of the session, if you could please send a direct message in the chat um, to James Aguchi, who is our primary Zoom host today with your suggestion. And that way we can um, collect a log of all of the suggestions. You're also welcome to email us after the session if that's easier to, or um, we can discuss it in our PCE3 Slack. But it would be great if um, we got some input through the direct message option. And the second announcement for today, uh, just like our previous sessions, is that we would like to invite you to participate in a very quick demographics poll. And your participation in this poll is completely voluntary, but we'd like to get a sense of who our audience is, what your field of study is, and where you're watching from. So hopefully on your screen, um, a poll has come up and you can just answer. I think there are three questions. I'll give you just 30 seconds or so to complete that. Um, I think we are good to go. It says that only 10% participated. I think the poll may have stopped. Um, James, do you want to start that poll again? Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry for the technical sorry. difficulties. I think it's up again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's better. <laughs> we have 76% participated. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to today's session. Um, today's session, as I said, is focused on early evolution. And the first portion of today's session will consist of three presentations by our three guest speakers. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Gustavo Catano Anoles from the University of Illinois, and we also have two research scientists from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so we have Dr. Zachary Moshman and PhD candidate Evram Fair. Um, please save all of your questions until after the uh, three talks are finished, and at that point you can post your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask your questions directly. And then we'll have a, a group Q&A discussion. So now to get started with today's presentations, we will start um, with a talk from Gustavo Catano Anoles, who will be presenting a brief topical overview of today's session theme of early evolution. Um, so Gustavo, as you are bringing up your presentation, I'll just do a quick introduction. Uh, so Gustavo is a professor of bioinformatics at the University of Illinois and an expert in the fields of computational biology and evolutionary and comparative genomics. His current interests focus on the origin and evolution structure of biomolog biological molecules, chemistries, networks, and functions of synthetic biology. He is using his expertise in bioinformatics and biochemistry to compute the origin of life and the genetic code. 
think you're ready to go. Um, yes. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Danielle, for your kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to introduce the subject uh, matter that is still to me uh, early evolution. Um, I've, I've been uh, very much interested uh, for many years, for two decades, basically, on, uh, on the, the structure of molecules and how this structure came to be in evolution. It's a, it's a major question. It's part of uh, the, uh, the general theme of origin of life, of course, but, uh, but it's, it's the early stages of biochemistry. That's what I've been uh, interested in. But I'm not going to talk uh, in this uh, short five slides I'm going to be presenting about the alternative views or the, or the actual data that's being produced, though you'll see some data. Um, the goal here for me is to, uh, you know, kind of pick your brains and uh, from a point of view of thinking more philosophically, you know, what is, what is the actual challenge of uh, early evolution? And, uh, and so my, my theme is going to be persistence in structure. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, when you look at, uh, at the origin of life and, and the origin of uh, diversification and so many questions, uh, you can use timelines and you would want for the timelines to be related to our Earth, isn't it? To the evolution of our Earth as the uh, Hadean Earth transformed through Snowball Earth or Syrian Earth, Tonian Earth into today's Earth, isn't it? And as this is unfolding, this is the environment where life unfolds, uh, we would want to know about uh, cellular history, isn't it? The, how a primordial soul turned into a less universal common ancestral cell, and then that led to a whole bunch of wonderful developments like multicellularity and so on. Uh, we would want also to understand the history of proteins, isn't it? Uh, we want to know whether the first uh, proteins were enzymes, how were they, you know, what was their structures, uh, how they did they function, and how that evolved into the modern protein world, the world of today. Um, and of course, we want also to understand ribosomal history. When is it, did it start? Uh, you know, when, when did it materialize fully uh, and how it diversified? So all these are just examples of the so many questions that we have in front of us. So this is a daunting exercise and it needs to be at planetary scale. That's the reality. So we need to link uh, biochemistry, the evolution of biochemistry to the evolution of our planet. Uh, now, in order for this to happen, uh, we have to have a property, and this property is persistence. Now, persistence, if you go to the dictionary, it's, it's defined as, uh, as, as to continue firmly or obstinately in a course of action in spite of difficulty. So if you think of that definition, that's kind of a natural selection defini definition, isn't it? So you have an environment, this difficulty, and you are obstinately, firmly towards a goal or some kind of goal. The other alternative definition, which is, is a term obsolete, is that it's to remain unchanged or fixed. That's interesting. And, and so I've, I've, I have a different definition. The definition of persistence is maintaining identity through time. Well, this, this is kind of, you know, uh, puzzling, you know, it's philosophical, it's quite puzzling. And I want to illustrate the puzzle with this, isn't it, or the, or the conundrum with this. Um, let's imagine that we want, we are interested in reconstructing the past of a sequence, you know, with the phylogenetic tools that we know. So we have eight sequences and we align them. Isn't the first thing that we want to do is to uh, find correspondences between the different amino acids in this case, because these are amino acid sequences. Um, you, you're going to see here in the alignment some interesting things. You know, first of all, there's an, quite a number of, of, of amino acid sites, amino acids in that poly, poly, uh, poly, uh, um, in, this, in this protein, it's in the protein segment, that are basically constant. They're unchanged, isn't it? They're identical, you know. So they have been maintaining identity through their evolution. If those sequences describe some relationship, a phylogenetic relationship or evolutionary relationship, and, and, but the problem with this is that they don't carry information, isn't it? We we want to to relate the sequences to each other, but if everything is identical, then we can't do that. 
But if we don't have anything identical, which would be the other extreme, then uh, there is no guarantee that all those sequences are homologous, are related to each other from, an, from a historical point of view. So we have this conundrum, isn't it? It's co the conundrum of persistence. You know, we want to maintain identity through time, but we, have, we need to have enough differences for us to kind of uh, dissect the problem. So, uh, so here I want to introduce the thought experiment of the ship of Theseus. Most of you probably know about this. Uh, this was put forth by Plutarch. Uh, this is a Greek uh, a historian and philosopher that lived in the time of the Roman Empire. Um, uh, well, this, is, this ship uh, was uh, the ship that uh, took uh, the hero of Athens, uh, you know, to his endeavors. And uh, it was preserved for three centuries by the Athenians. Uh, and, uh, and in the process, they had to uh, replace the old planks as they were decaying and putting new strong timber in their place. And uh, what uh, Plutarch says, in so much that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical questions of things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same and the other contending that it was not the same. So, uh, so as you can see where I am going, you know, I'm, I'm going with, uh, with how to explain the passage of time. And this is a philosophically a big, big problem. There are two opposing views that I'm illustrated with this Lorentz chaotic attractor, which is a deterministic system of ordinary differential equations with unpredictable solutions. And it forms this beautiful, uh, you know, structure that you see unfolding there. Let's say that, that this attractor manifests at time minus three, and time zero is the present, and then it unfolds up to time three, which is in the future, relative to time zero, of course. And uh, so there are two opposing views. You know, one is the views of uh, philosophical, uh, you know, uh, uh, philosophical area called per perdurantism or for the dimensionalism, also known as one theory, where things uh, have temporal parts and persist through both time and space by perduring. That means that. Uh, the thing lives past, present, and future. Uh, an alternative to that is the second uh, part B here in the figure is endurantism view, uh, the three-dimensionalism view. Things are wholly present whenever they exist. So they persist by enduring and by having spatial parts at different times. Now, I'm not going to extend on the philosophical aspects of this, but, uh, but I'm going just to say that perdurantism is a view compatible with evolution because we are interested in, in the object in its totality as it unfolds in time. And, uh, and the, the worm theory, uh, which is by the way compatible with Einstein equations and with a number of you know, concepts in physics and so on, um, it does justice to that phil uh, phylogenetic problem. So let, let, me, let me illustrate this with the Eiffel Tower. Um, the Eiffel Tower was constructed in Paris in 1880. It's, the construction started in 1887, uh, and it took basically three, three years to, to complete. Um, at, at beginning of 1887, the, the foundations were already laid, um, and, uh, and this occurred all the way up to uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, World's Fair of 1889, you know, it had to be completed at that time. And of course, it's a perduring object, isn't it? Uh, so you go back to go to Paris and you'll see the Eiffel Tower as the object, engineering object. It exists today. It's a persistent. And, uh, the, and the persistent unfolded during its construction through a number of innovations, isn't it? There was a special foundation that had to be uh, laid. Uh, uh, there were lateral legs, there was innovation for that time, the use of steel plates uh, to secure uh, the different component parts, steel angles, rivets. The bridge was recruited because it was often used to build bridges uh, throughout France. So that was, that was not a novelty, uh, but, uh, but the columns were and the riveted connections and the lattice work uh, and ultimately, even elevators had to be placed in, in the Eiffel Tower. So, so I'm bringing this because uh, the history of the ribosome that I'm illustrating with our research there uh, that started 3.3 uh, billion years ago, all the way up to 1.3 billion years when 
the universal core was completed, uh, had the same kind of situation. There was a phase one, you know, that I can call here of construction, and a phase two of diversification. The, Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower also diversified. Uh, pieces of it have been changed, uh, rearranged. Uh, uh, the, the entire bridge structure has been changed uh, some few years ago. So, uh, so yeah, there's diversification, but the entity of the Eiffel Tower is preserved. Um, at the bottom, you see uh, the evolution of the protein, isn't it? Uh, or, well, of the, you know, of the, of the protein world. Uh, so every dot in this network is a, a structural domain and the links are uh, the existence of structural domains in a protein. So every time you have a, li a line appearing there, you have a multi-domain protein appearing. As you can see, during the phase one, there's a buildup of all these innovations. And then there's a big bang occurring at the beginning of phase two that continues to the present. So again, two uh, different phases, clearly distinct phases unfolding in time. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we can, we can look at the ribosome at a particular time, and I can see all the innovations that appeared there. Uh, 3.1 uh, billion years ago, we had inter-subunit bridge contacts, a complete tRNA binding site, a functional peptidyl transferase center responsible for, for peptide synthesis an exit port and so on. And with, with time, you know, many innovations were added to the makeup of the ribosome. Uh, the interesting thing is that hierarchy and modularity seem to be unfolding as in this timelines, you know, in the same way as in the Eiffel Tower, uh, the steel plates are being used over and over again, or the steel angles and steel rivets to make all the connections, isn't it? So uh, there are modules, there are modules are being used over and over again to, uh, to produce the engineer construct. Uh, so uh, we see that unfold uh, in the timelines too, uh, not only modules, but our hierarchical structure. And this is important from a point of view of uh, complexity, understanding complexity. So the question that I have for you is, okay, uh, could phase one be early evolution? and phase two be late evolution. Uh, so my point is, well, in phase one, parts are combining, are un unifying to form a whole, and then that whole in phase two starts to diversify. So the question is, perhaps we have a, a, an enormous number, you know, millions of phases ones and phases two occurring, sometimes synchronously, sometimes not, in uh, the evolution of biochemistry. And, uh, and that poses a problem. It's a, is it a philosophical triviality or a difficulty, this issue of linking space, time, and identity and change, and, uh, and thinking that that perhaps is uh, necessary to the, understand the driving force of complexity. So I'm going to leave you here with this problem of growth. And the only thing I'm going to say is that chronologies help us in this endeavor of this sort, sorting out this problem of growth, isn't it? This is a, a, a word cloud of uh, times of origin of all these things that are listed there, all the way from protocells to uh, peptides, depeptidases, ATP synthases or whatever, and that uh, has come out of analysis of our proteome, the evolution of our proteome. And as you can see, there, there are ages there, 3.8 billion years ago, there is an area that is prebiotic chemistry and so on. So, uh, so this circle kind of en encompasses the two talks that uh, from Abraham and Zachary that will follow, which I'm really looking forward to because those are the probable time of origins of what they are kind of, uh, you know, uh, attempting to, to dissect uh, with their experiments. So uh, with that, I'm closing and thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity for an introduction. Great, thank you so much, Gustavo, that was great. Um, so we'll move directly into our first uh, longer presentation. So, um, our first presenter today is going to be Dr. Zachary Moshman. Um, Zach, if you'd like to put your slides up, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, so Zach Moshman went to the University of Colorado Boulder for his undergraduate studies where he performed research in the laboratories of David Walba and Amy Palmer. 
Following graduation in 2015, he enrolled in the Cornell Chemistry and Chemical Biology graduate program, where he studied the chemosensory apparatus for motility in E. coli under the advisement of Professor Brian Crane. He graduated his PhD in August 2021 and joined the laboratory of Katrina Forrest at University of Wisconsin-Madison the following year as a postdoc. So you can go ahead, Zach. All right, um, am I, everybody hearing me? Yep, sounds great and looks great. Fantastic, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zach Moshman and I'm, as uh, Danielle introduced me, I'm a postdoc uh, in Katrina Forrest's lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'd like to thank the organizers of this seminar series for inviting me to give this talk and to all of you for taking the time to attend, of course. Uh, today I'll be familiarizing you with some of the work I've been doing on how microbes catalyze the symmetry of their membrane bilayers, with particular emphasis on the importance of catalyzed bilayer symmetry for early life and for early evolution. All right, first I'll provide some uh, chemical information about the behavior of simple lipid bilayers, as well as some phylogenetically derived information about the cell membrane of the last universal common ancestor. Then, armed with that chemical and phylogenetic information, I will provide context for how cells solve one of the fundamental processes of membrane biogenesis. And finally, I will outline my experimental work and discuss what extant biological diversity can teach us about early membranes and their organization. I've also included on this slide a cartoon representation um, of the organization of the canonical phospholipid membrane bilayer, where phospholipids are arranged into two leaflets, forming a hydrophobic core shown in gray and two hydrophilic surfaces facing the cytoplasm and the cell exterior. Uh, put it up there for the uninitiated. I was told to expect an audience of chemists, so here we are. All right, so what do we know about the chemistry of ancient membranes? As far as I know, uh, based on the literature that I've read, I'm a newcomer to this field, but based on the literature that I've read, whether the first membranes contained charged head groups um, remains more or less an open question. However, the biogenesis of a membrane composed of lipids with charged head groups is worth thinking about from a chemical perspective. Now, the figure that I'm showing on the left part of this slide uh, is taken from a paper that was published in 2000. The authors used closed phospholipid vesicles supplemented with oleic acid, which I've shown over here um, on the far right. And I've also represented down here what the oleic acid actually looks like um, in the figure. Um, that's just for ease of understanding. And basically the figure describes a model for the scrambling of fatty acids across the membrane of phospholipids when a pH gradient is imposed. And the results are kind of interesting. Before the addition of hydrochloric acid, uh, the fatty acids, oleic acid, are equally distributed between the membrane leaflets. You know, some of them are protonated, some of them are not. Um, but then when they add hydrochloric acid to one side of the membrane, all of the fatty acids, all the oleic acid on that side of the membrane becomes protonated and they flip. Uh, they Uncharged fatty acids can flip between the two membranes of the bilayer quite readily. And so they become protonated, they become uncharged, they flip to the other side of the membrane, and then they deprotonate because the pH is different um, on the other side of the membrane. Now, the interesting thing about this experiment, and really the point um, that I'd like to make, the point that I'm tr trying to make um, showing you this experiment, um, is that the back transfer of those charged oleic acids um, was undetectable. It was undetectably low. Once they're charged on one side of the membrane, um, they're not going to flip back across. And that's really very significant. Um, it reveals something about the rate at which charged lipid head groups can cross the hydrophobic interior of a membrane. And cells need to have a way of doing that in order to construct the cell membranes that characterize them. In fact, transporting a charged lipid head group across the hydrophobic interior of the membrane is the central problem of lipid scrambling, equilibrating phospholipids between bilayer leaflets. All right, now that um, some basic membrane biophysics has been described, 
Uh, we should now, we're gonna now turn to what phylogeny can tell us about the earliest membranes that existed in cells. Or, yeah. Presented here as the famous phylogenetic tree based on 16S ribosomal DNA describing the evolutionary relationship between the three domains of life. At the root of the tree is the last universal common ancestor, LUCA. Uh, the results uh, I described on the previous slide regarding the rate of charged uh, lipid scrambling uh, is relevant to questions of early life as phylogenetic analyses have revealed that the last universal common ancestor likely had a single cell membrane composed of phospholipids with charged head groups, uh, and not surprisingly may have been composed of phospholipids with characteristics of both archaeal and bacterial lipids. Now, bearing all of this in mind, I'm going to now move on to describing in more detail lipid scrambling, uh, which is an essential cellular process apparently necessary for the last universal common ancestor and for the cells which descended from it. So how do extant cells scramble lipids? And we'll get into some molecular detail here. All right, shown here uh, is a phospholipid membrane explaining the essential problem of lipid scrambling. Equal distribution of phospholipids between the inner and outer leaflets is thermodynamically favored. However, transporting the charged head group across the hydrophobic membrane pore represents a significant kinetic barrier that prevents spontaneous lipid scrambling. And I've shown that here with these little red explosions. Um, it's quite fun to put those in. Uh, this problem exists in extant cells um, because phospholipids are synthesized on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. Therefore, establishing the bilayer leaflet equilibrium cannot be achieved without some kind of facilitator. And I, that's just the rate of lipid scrambling in, um, in just lipid vesicles. Now in living cells, lipid scrambling is achieved using what's called a scramblase. Scramblases are transmembrane proteins that are thought to shield the charged head groups of phospholipids from the hydrophobic membrane pore using a facilitated diffusion channel uh, that provides stabilizing interactions. And those stabilizing interactions are represented here by the, uh, the colors of the phospholipid charged, the charged phospholipids heads and the color of the actual uh, membrane channel. Uh, scramblases greatly increase the rate of phospholipid flow uh, between the leaflets of the bilayer. And they do this quickly enough to, pr to permit membrane growth, um, which is really, why they are essential genes. All right, now here is just this little table that I put together of some of the confirmed scramblases in biochemistry uh, to provide the audience with a sense for just how little is actually known about them. Um, and that's, that's worth paying attention to as well, um, the accessory functions of these scramblases. Um, over here, you've got, you know, bacterial rhodopsin is a light dependent proton pump uh, bovine rhodopsin is a photoreceptor, and then an ATG2 is involved in autophagosome formation. Um, they're, they, you know, appear to be multifunctional, at least in many cases. Um, and it's curious, I'm curious to know whether or not that's generalizable as well, just as an added thought, I suppose. Now, if we take the scramblases from the previous slide and map them onto the tree of life, like so, um, we can clearly see that um, no bacterial scramblases have been identified. There are, however, two opsins that make the list. We have um, archaeal bacteria rhodopsin and um, human bovine rhodopsin. Um, and of course, many bacteria also encode opsins, and perhaps they too are scramblases. And as it happens, the forest lab has previously characterized ACTAR, and that's the name of the protein. It's an opsin found in a very abundant freshwater actinobacterium called AC1. And like archaeal bacterial rhodopsin, um, which as I mentioned before is also a scramblase, ACTAR pumps protons across the cytoplasmic membrane in a light and retinal dependent manner to form a gradient that can be harnessed for ATP synthesis. And I've indicated on this slide uh, the direction that it translates it's protons, and this is the retinal chromophore that is sensitive to green light and harnesses it uh, to pump those protons across the membrane and establish a gradient. Uh, that's a fire two model of Actar um, based on a very similar structure on Actar, uh, Selenibacter ruber example rhodopsin. Uh, the high trend, so there. That the high transcript level of Actar in the freshwater of Lake Mendota, which I've also shown here, 
suggests that the membranes of AC1 contain a very, very high content um, of, of ACTAR. However, despite robust transcription of ACTAR in native environments, many sequenced AC1 genomes lack the uh, enzymatic machinery uh, to synthesize retinal, strongly suggesting that ACTAR has a different, you know, a second retinal independent function. And we suspected, based on this, that it might be a scramblase. But how do we test, how would we test ACTAR scramblase activity? The lipid scrambling rates that I referenced on previous slides are uh, measured using an in vitro fluorescent scramblase assay, which I have detailed here. On the left uh, is a short description of the protocol for preparing liposomes supplemented with fluorescently labeled with the fluorescent labeled phospholipid NBDPE, which is actually shown down here. NBDPE, uh, the fluorescence group of NBDPE is this nitrobenzoxidiazole moiety shown in red. And over here is a little schematic showing you how it actually sits in the membrane. Um, these are the bulk uh, components of the liposomes, the proteoliposomes uh, that we use to do this assay. POPC is phosphatidylcholine and POPG is phosphatidylglycerol. Um, we take these liposomes, um, when we create them with a small amount of NBDPE added, NBDPE equally distributes between the inner and outer leaflets of the liposome. And when we add dithionite, NBDPE is covalently modified to ABDPE and fluorescence is abolished. Now, if you don't, you know, if, if you're dealing with just a lipid vesicle, just the liposome, and you add in the dithionite, you retain fluorescence from the inner leaflet of, of the liposome, of the lipid vesicle. But if you have a scramblase indicated in these figures by a little, uh, by a little cyan um, uh, cartoon there. If you have a scramblase, the rapid exchange between the inner and outer leaflets um, abolishes fluorescence um, much further. And that's, this is the, that's the assay um, that we use to uh, test for scramblase activity. Now, shown, so we've tested whether or not ACTAR is a scramblase, and shown here are the NBD fluorescence traces of our negative controls, which are liposomes. Dithionite was added at time zero, and the fluorescence decay is consistent with zero or undetectably low uh, lipid scrambling. Bovine opsin in these experiments served as the positive control for the scramblase assay, and as you can see, a uh, rapid exchange of the lipids between the inner and outer leaflets is evident in the fluorescence trace. And these are our three ACTAR samples, which display scramblase acti activity consistent with our positive control. And so I can now go back to that table that I showed you on the previous slide with some with an interesting omission. Um, and there we have it. ACTAR is the first scramblase identified in bacteria. And this is significant because, um, you know, very, very few scramblases have been identified so far. And now we have one in bacteria. And there are far more um, genetic mechanisms that we have available to us to investigate uh, bacteria that will allow us to learn more about scramblases, their structural biology, their functions, and their significance to extant life and to early life. And so with that, I'll go on to um, discuss some of the experiments that I'd like, that I'd like to do using ACTAR to learn more about scramblases in nature. So, let me just put that up anyway. Um, as opsin scramblases have been found in all three domains of life now, in archaea, eukaryotes, and now bacteria, we began to wonder if scramblase activity is just common to opsins. So we're going to be looking at, particularly in this experiment, at proteorhodopsins, opsins in bacteria. On the left is a schematic of the previously described scramblase assay adapted for a 96 well format. In panel B over here, um, Candidate proteorhodopsins will be cloned into plasmid DNA, and transcription reactions will, will be performed in a 96 well plate. That's plate one. The, this, the mRNA generated in those reactions will then be pipetted into a second 96 well plate um, containing translation reactions. Uh, this, you know, um, and when they're when these transmembrane proteins are uh, translated, they'll be incorporated in a single step into lipid vesicles containing NBDPE, our fluorescent phospholipid, and they'll be ready for a scramblase assay. 
Um, the idea is then you just um, add dithionite and after a certain amount of time, you'll be able to tell whether or not you're dealing with liposomes without scramblase activity or liposomes with scramblase activity. On the left in panel A over here is just a general breakdown of what the translation reactions look like. Um, and then over here on the right um, is preliminary data. I performed these assays in a 96 volt plate containing buffer liposomes and liposomes containing weak germ extract, which contains a scramblase. Uh, dithionate was added to each well um, shortly after time zero, um, except for the two control wells that are highlighted in yellow that I did as control experiments to make sure that the fluorescence um, measurements weren't damaging the lipids uh, too far and giving us a false positive. Um, and of course, the NBD fluorescence uh, dropped in each of these two uh, the proportions that I'm highlighting here in the small figure below it. Um, now, but yeah, so we were, we're, we're able, these, these assays essentially show that we are able to, our liposome preps are working and we are able to detect um, scramblase activity in them, uh, in this assay. And the results from this experiment, when it gets up and going, will not only shed light on how widespread scramblase activity is among opsins, but it may also allow us to identify key structural elements responsible for opsin scramblase activity. The most interesting result from this experiment would be if some proteoridopsins do have scramblase activity and some don't. That way we can compare and contrast their structures. But of course, some bacteria do not encode opsins. The previous slide detailed experiments designed to investigate scramblase activity in opsins, um, but some bacteria don't have them. And of course, these bacteria still require scramblases in order to grow their cell membranes. And we would like to identify some of those other scramblases and model organisms using the following strategy. Just very briefly, uh, beginning in Bacillus subtilis, what we're going to do is use uh, essentially gene no uh, knockouts of essential genes, in this case, uh, transmembrane um, uh, genes with gene products that are transmembrane proteins. We'll knock out these essential genes, we'll supplement ACTAR, and we'll see which of them survive. Um, because and essentially, you know, in essence, we're going to identify the native scramblase by showing that bacillus can only grow in its absence if it is supplemented with an exogenous scramblase. And we should be able to figure out which protein is responsible for lipid scrambling in bacillus. And on the right is a pie chart um, that I just put together. Uh, detailing the identified functions of bacillus subtilis transmembrane essential gene products. Um, yeah. And I would like to end this talk with a reflection on the structural diversity of lipids across all three domains of life. I mean, it really is quite remarkable. Uh, the sheer structural diversity of lipids across bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes provides us with some sense of the structurally and potentially, like the structural and potentially functional diversity. Um, of scramblases across you know, across life, and um, a greater knowledge of these essential enzymes will inform greatly on the roles that scramblases play, um, and on the role that they played in the earliest organisms. As we get, you know, as we identify more scramblases, we'll have more to work with in terms of phylogeny, and we'll be able to start to really make um, well, confidently make statements um, about what membranes must have been like in the earliest organisms. And of course, with that, I would um, like to uh, thank uh, my PI, Professor Katrina Forrest, my fellow lab mates and our collaborators, and of course, all of you for coming to attend this talk. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Zach. It was great. So we will, um, like I said, hold the questions until after our final presentation, and we'll just move straight into Evram's talk. So Evram, if you'd like to upload your um, PowerPoint, do a quick introduction. So Evram is a PhD student in the Kachar lab in the Department of Bacteriology, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Evram obtained a Bachelor of Science degree from the Department of Molecular Biology Genetics at Istanbul Technical University in Turkey and a master's degree from the Department of Bioinformatics at Middle East Technical University in Turkey under the supervision of Professor Mehmet Somel. For her PhD work, Evram is working with Dr. Betul Kachar on understanding the origin and evolution of early translation machinery. Um, hello everyone, uh, do you see my uh, screen? Yeah, 
it looks great and sounds great too. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and invitation for this uh, seminar series. My name is Evrim, and uh, today I will talk about early evolution of translation. Uh, in the first half of the presentation, I will uh, explain the translation machinery in general. And then uh, in the other half, I will focus on two uh, translation factors and their evolution. Uh, so translation system is the center for protein production. And as the proteins are one of the functional units, translation is a very fundamental process for all cells. Uh, translation machinery can be considered as a molecular computer that connects two types of polymers. Basically, it takes a nucleotide string as an input, decodes the message in this nucleotide polymer, and uh, it gives a peptide as an output. So, in this way, actually, we also think that uh, translation is a link between genotype and uh, phenotype. The translation system uses universally conserved genetic code, molecular structures, molecular assemblies, uh, biopolymer structures, and chemical processes, which are present in all organisms today. Uh, because translation is so conserved, it is thought that the uh, basic mechanism of translation must have emerged early in the history of molecular evolution, and even before the existence of genetically encoded proteins. It is also thought that the uh, last universal common ancestor had an established and functional translation machinery approximately 3.8 billion years ago. Tran so transition is a very ancient process, and it also uh, very dominated by RNA molecules. And because of that, it is a great target for origin origin and evolution of life studies, uh, especially for RNA world hypothesis. To remind that what uh, this hypothesis is, it suggests that it suggests that an RNA-only system probably preceded the modern biological systems. Because RNA molecules carry information, they have catalytic activity, and also uh, they are able to self-replicate. Uh, the modern translation reflects an RNA-based history, but it's a very complex system, including uh, other proteins too. And the problem of original translation includes some central problems, such as how genetic code arised, what were the driving forces for translation evolution, and if translation relies on other proteins to synthesize more proteins, which one came first? So therefore, as mentioned by different researchers uh, previously, uh, as I am showing here, Origin of translation is one of the hardest problems, and it is very challenging to explain how translation could evolve from a primitive RNA world. Uh, here, I would like to switch the gears a little, a little bit and uh, try to explain what we know about modern translation machinery and some translation components uh, starting from the ribosome. So ribosome is an RNA and protein complex, and it is the core of translation. Ribosome is composed of two major uh, subunits, large and small subunits. The large subunit catalyzes polypeptide formation at the peptidyl transfer center, while the small subunit uh, decodes the genetic code in mRNA. Uh, within each domain of life, the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, the ribosomes uh, usually contain the same set of ribosomal RNA and protein chains uh, at the common core. However, moving out of the common core region, we start to see variations of length and sequence of ribosomal components, as well as, well as uh, a diversity in the structure, their interactions, and protein content. Uh, the evolution of ribosome over time is like a peeling an onion model, uh, previously stated by Shao et al. And according to that model, when we go other radius, of the ribosome, uh, we start to see decrease in the sequence conservation across different organisms. And also we see some additional uh, proteins, especially in eukaryotes, there are additional ribosomal proteins and extensional uh, segments, uh, sequential segments in both ribosomal RNAs and proteins. Uh, it is thought that these extensions probably uh, represents some ribosomal adaptations to specific environments or uh, organism lifestyles. Um, so ribosome is a great macromolecule and it, it is the center of the translation, but it is not the only molecule that modern translation needs. 
Uh, so through the three main steps of transition, uh, which are initiation, elongation, termination, it relies on the activity of different transition factors as well. Uh, here I am showing the transition factors that function in uh, each step of bacterial uh, transition system. So each transition step is uh, mechanistically conserved in all cells, but also diverge in a large extent of uh, different protein composition and their interactions. For example, uh, initiation is the first step, first rate limiting step of translation. And in this step, initiation factors make sure that the ribosome starts from the right side on the mRNA and the ribosome assemble correctly. While bacteria initiation requires uh, three initiation factors, IF1, IF2, and IF3, archaeal and eukaryotic transition needs uh, need more initiation factors. Uh, elongation factors are also important for fast and accurate protein synthesis, but unlike initiation factors, uh, the bacterial elongation factors and their homologs uh, are generally very conserved across uh, all domains. Similarly, the termination or release factors also do not vary across domains too much, but the main difference in release factor is they do not share a common evolutionary history across bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Uh, so until here, we look at the ribosome and what happens in the ribosome. But uh, transition is much more than that. Uh, many of the fundamental processes, such as ribosomal protein modifications, ribosomal RNA, tRNA, mRNA, or uh, uh, RNA modifications, and uh, amino acid tRNA synthesis uh, occur beyond the ribosome it itself. For example, uh, amino acid tRNA synthetases uh, charge tRNAs with the correct amino acid and make sure that the genetic code in the tRNA anticodon uh, match with the correct amino acid. But uh, modern transit, uh, so this uh, process happens outside of the ribosome, but translation is not possible without correctly amino acid tRNAs. So the translation has it still fundamental sub-processes outside of the ribosome, and we, we shouldn't ignore them. Uh, indeed, all the components in modern translation works in a coordinated way, uh, and all components uh, binds in a correct time or, or dissoci dissociates from the complex in the, uh, on the correct time. So removing any of them uh, disrupt the translation. For example, if we remove IF2, the translation may not start from the right side or the ribosome may not assemble correctly. And that leads to, uh, that, that cause that the uh, translation stops. Similarly, if you remove EFTU, the elongation process cannot happen and protein translation is disrupted in the end. So, uh, however, we are unaware of uh, in what degree an early translation is possible at a reasonable rate and accuracy without ribosome tRNAs, amino acid tRNA synthetases, or uh, other translation uh, components. So, therefore, I am interested in origin and evolution of translation and want to answer some central questions like uh, how did the translation look like in the last universal common ancestor? Did Luca have uh, all translation components and uh, similar to bacterial one? Or Luca translation work with uh, even fewer components than a bacterial translation? <clears throat> did the translation steps evolve at the same time or in a stepwise fa fashion? And how does a uh, translation machinery adapt to specific uh, environmental pressures uh, very rapidly? But on the other hand, they, these uh, the functions are, of the translation components are still so conserved. And to answer these questions, the, my biggest question is, how can we study early translation using uh, evolutionary thinking? So, Studying the ancestral functions of some translation components may help us to understand uh, early, early translation. Uh, so for example, we focused on two translation factors, initiation factor two and elongation factor two. Uh, IF2 uh, function is associated with the recruitment of 
initiator tRNA to P site of the ribosome. On the other hand, EFTU recruits all other elongated tRNAs to the A site of the ribosome. So they are acting on different steps of the uh, translation and bind to different type of, type of uh, tRNAs. But IFT and EF2 are interesting because they also share some similarities, uh, such as they are both GTPases and hydrolyzed GTP into GDP. They both bind to tRNA. They show a sequence homology, especially at their GTP binding domains. And they also show structural homology uh, at GTP binding domain and also their tRNA binding domains. And as I mentioned earlier, they are both essential for cellular viability. All this similarity and homology between IF2 and EF2 lead to the idea that these two uh, proteins may share a common ancestor. Uh, but if, if they share a common ancestor, ancestor, what would be the function of this IF2 EF2 common ancestral protein? Uh, was it more IF2 like, more EF2 like, or uh, had both functions? So even though this hypothesis uh, for IF2 EF2 ancestry, uh, common ancestry was suggested uh, in several studies, it has not been tested before. So we tried to we tried to predict the functionality of the common ancestor using a method called ancestral sequence uh, reconstruction. Uh, so this method uh, starts with the creation of data set uh, of extant proteins and then continues with performing a multiple sequence alignment. Then we reconstruct a phylogenetic tree using the aligned sequences and best fitting evolutionary model. Finally, we can infer the ancestral sequence at the phylogenetic node of interest using maximum likelihood approach. The inferred ancestral sequence can be used for a further sequence or structural analysis, or even can be synthesized in modern organisms and uh, used for some protein characterization uh, in in vivo in uh, or in vitro systems. Uh, so in our study, uh, we started to collect protein sequences for IF2 and EF2 proteins, and we uh, collected 408 sequences for each, each protein, and uh, from 17 different bacterial phyla and archaeal organisms. Uh, we performed our analysis in two ways. Uh, one is using the whole sequences to interpret the GTPS function in the common ancestor. And the other way is a domain-based approach, which we use the tRNA binding domains of IF2, which is C2, uh, and tRNA binding domain of EF2, which is D2 here. So, uh, and in this way, we try to interpret tRNA binding function in the common ancestor. Uh, then we performed multiple sequence alignment for both uh, all sequences and uh, tRNA binding domain sequences. Using this, the, this alignment uh, and found uh, evolutionary models, we reconstructed IF2 EF2 phylogeny as well as C, C2D2 phylogeny for tRNA binding. Uh, from these phylogenies, we inferred the sequences for IF2 ancestor, EF2 ancestor, and IF2 EF2 common ancestor. Um, and then using the ancestral sequences, we modeled the ancestral structures and performed structural alignment analysis. Uh, to construct IF2 and EF2 phylogenies, uh, we used different alignment methods, which are mouth and muscle. We combined each alignment with different uh, uh, evolutionary models, which are best fitted and second, second best fitted evolutionary models. Uh, since we don't know which protein came first, we didn't want to bias the common ancestor using an outgroup. Therefore, we rooted the trees using different methods, which are minimal ancestor deviation, midpoint and um, mid midpoint routing, and minimum variance routing. In the end, we obtained 12 IF2 EF2 trees. And as you can see, all the trees separated uh, IF2 and EF2 sequences with uh, high support values, which are uh, greater than 90%. Uh, 
According to maximum likelihood approach, the trees uh, constructed with uh, MAFT and uh, best evolutionary model LGFR10, uh, this combination had the uh, highest likelihood score. So therefore, we used this tree and the ancestral sequences coming for this coming from these trees. Uh, we, we use them for the further sequence analysis. Uh, we first look at the GTPS function in the common ancestor. We align the sequence sequence of uh, common ancestor with the last common ancestor of IF2, last common ancestor of EF2, and E. coli IF10 EF2 sequences. Here, the gray columns indicate that uh, the sites are 100% uh, conserved in the alignment, and from with this alignment, we showed that uh, the, mo the motifs that are important for GTP binding and GTPS function, uh, such as G1, uh, G2, G3, and G4, are all conserved in the uh, all sequences. So from here, uh, we pre so this indicates that the common ancestor probably had a uh, functional G GTPS uh, domain. Uh, then we look at the identity of GTP binding region uh, of the common ancestor with other uh, proteins in the small alignment. And here you see the pairwise identities between each uh, aligned sequences. Uh, here we showed that the common ancestor GTP binding domain uh, has higher uh, sequence identity to IF2 sequences. So for modern IF2 and EF2 proteins, um, we, we know that the conformational changes uh, happen when they bind to GTP molecules. And especially at the switch two, uh, which switch two region, uh, which is at the heart of GTP binding domain, that there, uh, there's uh, uh, this, this region undergoes some conformational changes when GTP binds. So these conformation changes are more profound in EFTU than IF2. And since we found GTP binding region of the common ancestor is uh, more identical to IF2, we predict that uh, the ancestral GTP binding region might show similar conformational change features to the IF2 proteins. Uh, next, we look at the tRNA binding function in the common ancestor. And for that, we use the tRNA binding domain-based uh, alignments. Here you can see the trees for tRNA binding regions of IF10, EF2. Again, we use different routing methods, and they all separated the IF2, EF2 sequences except midpoint routing, which uh, uh, which EF2 sequences are branched with RQL IF2. Uh, in panel B. Uh, we align tRNA binding domain of the common ancestor again with the IF2 ancestor, uh, C, last common ancestor of C2, last common ancestor of EF2 tRNA binding D2, and E. coli uh, EF2 IF2 tRNA binding domains. Uh, in this alignment, the gray uh, areas show 100% conserved sites, and purple regions uh, highlight the functional residues for tRNA binding in IF2. Uh, unlike GTP, G GTP binding domain, the sequence uh, is less conserved. Um, and from this alignment, we showed that the tRNA binding of common ancestor has higher identity to ancestral IF2. But it also has equal identity to E. coli IF2 and EF2 tRNA binding domains. Uh, from here, we uh, predicted that the common ancestor prob probably able to bind the tRNA, but it's uh, its specialization for different tRNA types is a uh, <clears throat> later event. So in summary, uh, with our study, we showed that IF2, EF2 common ancestor exhibited IF2-like properties, uh, which in previous literature uh, literatures, it was the opposite one uh, was uh, suggested, more EF2-like properties. But in our study, we found uh, IF2-like properties based on the sequence. 
the function of uh, IF2 EF2 common ancestor uh, may not fully optimize for initiation or elongation at the time of preluca. And we suggest the model for IF2 EF2 divergence, where um, the after a duplication event, IF2 ancestor became more specialized for initiator tRNA binding, while uh, EF2 ancestor continues to co evolve with the different elongated tRNAs. And our results from this study were uh, recently published at Protein Science. And if you are interested in uh, interested to read more about this study, uh, it is in the latest issue of the uh, Protein Science Journal. So as a take home message of my presentation, uh, early translation like we had fewer parts, uh, maybe had an alternative translation requiring less uh, translation factors. And secondly, our, in our study, we focused on two translation factors, but to be able to understand early translation more broadly, the integration of other translation components is uh, necessary. And finally, I would like to uh, thank my supervisor, Dr. Betul Kachar and PhD candidate, Kate McGrath uh, for their contributions in the study. And also thank all Kachar lab members for their discussions and feedbacks. I also want to thank uh, our collaborators who we work with uh, for translation project, Dr. Robert Landik, Dr. Sparna Sanyal, Dr. Liana Gi, Dr. Uh, Adam Hockenberry, and I would like to thank uh, John, John Templeton Foundation and uh, University of Wisconsin Foundation to support this project. Uh, I, with this, I think th this is all I have and we will be happy to take your questions at the end of session. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for such a nice talk. Um, so we are, uh, we'll finish our three presentations and we'll move into the group um, Q&A discussion. So feel free to um, post your questions in the chat or you're also welcome to raise your hand and you can ask your question um, live with your microphone. Um, I also just wanted to remind everyone that um, while, you know, as we're talking through this discussion, if you have any ideas that come to mind in terms of topics for future PCE3 seminars, um, please feel free to uh, directly message James Aguchi with those ideas and we're happy to take that, um, some suggestions. So yeah, so does anyone have any questions in the audience? Um, okay, we have a question from Paul Harrison. I'll ask you to unmute. Actually, I was just I was just applauding your talk. Okay. <laughs> Excellent work. Okay, so we have a question from uh, William Saucier in the chat says, for Evrim Fair, have you synthesized the IF2, EF2 ancestral protein and tested its function? Um, we haven't synthesized it yet, but we are working on it. So uh, the other PhD candidate, uh, Katie, is working on uh, this part of the uh, project and she's uh, she actually uh, started to work on the ancestral IF2 proteins and uh, showed that the ancestral IF2 proteins can uh, be functional, but we are working on going more past uh, currently. And uh, when we have the results uh, ready, we will be able to share them. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Donald Burke. I will ask you to unmute. I'm trying to figure out how to how to push the, uh, uh, how to press all the buttons here. Okay, fine. Uh, hey, thanks. That was a really nice talk. Uh, my first question is for Evram. I'm still trying to formulate his ask. That was also a very fascinating talk. But we'll start with Evram. Um, so I've always wondered how in the process of defining an ancestral sequence, how you deal with 
uncertainty along the way. Every position in the sequence, you know, you're making decisions and they're probabilistic decisions. Um, but there's a certain amount of uncertainty there as well. Um, yeah, so at the level of, of, of deciding, hey, this is our proposed ancestral sequence, how do you deal with that uncertainty there? And then when you get to trying to synthesize the genes, do you incorporate any of that into making a, a population of potential uh, genes, maybe dozens or hundreds or thousands of variants that are all not necessarily equally probable, but all conceivably uh, possible given the constraints of the data you have? Um, so about how uh, we are certain about ancestral sequences is, uh, so we are not certain about them. So probably uh, these ancestral sequences uh, are not the uh, certain ancestral sequences. Uh, and But in our methods, uh, we mostly focus on the positions which ha have the uh, highest likelihoods. So in, a, in an ancestral sequence, there are some sites uh, predicted with low certainty and like more ambiguous, but also there are some uh, sites which are more uh, like have high, higher probabilities, like uh, greater than 90%. So when we try to uh, interpret a function, we mostly focus on those uh, sites which are more uh, like less um, ambiguous. Um, so in, in the case of when we try to synthesize them, uh, sometimes when while by changing this un, uh, uncertain size with the second best uh, residues, we can generate alternative sequences and see how much uh, they affect to the function. And also when we try to uh, synthesize them, we also think about the organism's codon usage and try to find, uh, try to uh, refine the gene according to the organism, uh, if that is your question. Those are indeed my questions. Uh, sounds like it's a, it's a continual challenge uh, for the field, but um, the inferences that you're, that you're drawing at this point sound like they're not strictly dependent upon getting every position right. In other words, uh, your interpretation may be robust to that level of ambiguity. Would you say that that's the case? Uh, can, can you repeat that? That, you're, that, you're, that your interpretations are not strictly dependent upon getting every uh, assignment of every position correct, that there is some robustness to your yes. interpretation. Yes. Nice. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have another question in the chat from uh, Jim. It says, do you feel that your work supports the idea that the history of life on this planet should be one of long periods of stasis interrupted by short periods of intense change? I'm not sure if that's directed to one or both of you. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I really have too much to say on that subject. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I suppose that's an, it's quite, it seems quite possible to me um, that that's an accurate description of the history of life on earth. Um, but I don't really um, have too much to say on that subject vis-a-vis uh, -vis my own work, I guess. Okay, no problem. Evram, do you have comments or? Um, I mean, in my case, uh, so by long periods of stasis or in interruptions, uh, so translation system is very uh, critical for cells. So any environmental change, uh, the cell try to make sure that translation is still going on. So I think uh, it, during the history of life, uh, it's one of the, processes that might be affected, but it's hard to track that, uh, that history. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Basak to unmute. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, hi, Evrim. I have some questions to you. Uh, first of all, you said that IFTU and EFTU does not vary between domains. And what about uh, between species? I mean, do they vary between species? Um, sorry, can you repeat the last question again? Um, do IFTU and EFTU vary between species? They are uh, secrets, I mean. Mm -hmm. So IF2 and EF, uh, EF2 is very conserved and it has homologs in uh, archaea and eukaryotes. Uh, but for in, in the case of IF2, it's a little bit uh, di diverse. Uh, so in bacteria, there is one IF2 protein, one uh, protein that does the uh, two jobs, uh, requisite initiator TNA and uh, also assemble the ribosome. But archaea and eukaryotes have two different IF2 uh, homologs, which are one, one of them uh, uh, is function for the ribosome assembly. The other one actually does the uh, TRNA recruitment. So IF2 varies the, uh, across the organisms, but EF2 is very uh, conserved. Okay, thank you. And the other one uh, is that, did you choose IFTU and EFTU to do phylogenetic reconstruction just because they uh, are poss they possibly have a common ancestor? Uh, yes, so based on the some shared similarities and uh, based on their sequence homology, structural homology, and uh, functional similarities, uh, it was hypothesized that a common ancestor was hypothesized and we actually will our uh, study on this hypothesis and focus on that common ancestor. Okay, thank you. And uh, which phylogenetic tools do you use? Uh, we use, I mean, I, I used IQ3. Mm -hmm. and okay. So for more details, uh, you can also look at the paper. Better. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Zen. Uh, it says, hi, Zach. Might the lipid rafts in a cell membrane also be organized or regulated by the proteins you are studying? Um, that's a very good question. Um, there's been quite a bit of research done on lipid rafts, at least. Um, I haven't looked into them specifically, um, uh, but yeah, it's conceivable. Um, it might be the case that, you know, you need a scramblase in order to um, arrange phospholipids on you know, both sides of the membrane in order to create the lipid raft. Um, it also is possible that some of these um, lipids don't require scramblases, but also require like other lipid transport proteins that actually require um, an energy input. Like they have all kinds of funny names like flipases and flopases. Um, as to the evolutionary histories of those lipid um, transmembrane uh, transporters. I, um, I'm not quite sure there's really been a large study on that, although I may be wrong. Um. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is um, from Bruno, and it says, um, considering the super low translocation rate between sides of membranes without scramblazes, do you know if the if this is used as a way to store energy by any organisms? Um, I don't know if that's a way, if used as a way of uh, storing energy by um, certain organisms. What I do know is that there's a scramblase TMEM16. Um, it, under normal conditions, an asymmetry in lipids is maintained. An asymmetry of phosphatidylserine is maintained. Um, they're located on one leaflet only. And the scramblase, is act, the scramblase is activated to equilibrate the um, uh, to equilibrate the both sides of the membranes as part of a uh, part of a signaling process, more or less. So there, you know, cells are doing all kinds of interesting things with lipid symmetry and asymmetry. Um, but I don't know of any instances where it's specifically used to store energy. No, I mean, conceivably, it could be. I guess. Great. It's an interesting okay. question. 
We have another question for you, Zach, um, from Becca. It says, is there structural homology among the scramblazes, even in the case of no sequence homology that could assist in the identification of new scramblazes, perhaps using alpha fold? Um, that's a good question. Um, there have been some reviews um, done on this. Um, um, in particular, this one um, that came out of Anant, Anant Menon's lab, who was one of our collaborators. Uh, there doesn't really seem to be any straightforward um, structural homology. Uh, it's, there's also a little bit of disagreement between exactly how um, scramblaces at a structural level are um, facilitating lipid scrambling. Um, but conceivably, uh, I mean, yeah, if, if we're able to um, figure out what structural features are required um, to promote lipid scrambling, absolutely, like alpha fold could easily um, be used to figure that out. I mean, there's like already a Dolly server, right? Um, that uh, you can just feed in a protein structure and find other um, homologous structures. And conceivably, software like that could easily be used to just to um, figure out which proteins are likely to be scramblases. And you just, I can imagine even coming up with like a ranking system um, pretty easily. Yeah, that's possible, might be possible. Okay, and then another scramblaze question. Is it known whether cholesterol or other sterile lipids are moved across the membrane by scramblazes? Um, I haven't looked that into that specifically, but I don't think, um, I don't imagine uh, a scramblaze would be required for like say cholesterol or as you mentioned, other sterols. Um, you really, it seems to be required when there is a charged head group on the lipid. And of course, cholesterol, I think has an OH group, but um, not, you know, that's, that's, that doesn't seem to be something that's uh, so pro that's, that's necessarily prohibited. Okay, great. So um, that was our last question in the chat. Um, just wait another second in case there are any other questions. And anyone is welcome to raise their hand as well and just ask their question live. Okay. So if not, um, then I think we will end this session just a few minutes early and uh, just wanted to, oh, no, actually we do have one question. <laughs> uh, Rayanne, I'll ask you to unmute. Hi, uh, I'm a high school graduate from uh, Turkey. I have a question for Evrim. Uh, but first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, currently, uh, I'm in a position to be able to study molecular biology and genetics in Boston University here in Turkey. But I'm also considering applying for uh, universities in abroad. The question that I wanted to ask was, um, what would you recommend to people like me uh, who want to uh, study in this field from a realistic point of view. Thank you so much. Uh, so that's a good question. So uh, I think you can uh, try to uh, follow the people who are working on this uh, field as much as you can and uh, try to attend some conferences. And also, um, I mean, in general, you can uh, try to read the papers. And uh, if you have some interest, you can also write those people about your questions. Uh, but I think I can give more uh, suggestions uh, if you contact me after this uh, session. We also have a Slack group, I think, you, and I can be more helpful there. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, we have a Slack group that we can, um, Oh, Becca just posted it in the chat so we can continue uh, discussions, especially discussions like that um, for advice career-wise. It's a great place to do that. Um, and we have a question from John, so I'll ask John to unmute. Um, I'm wondering if Gustavo is still available to answer a question. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, my question is both philosophy and science related. Um, is evolutionary diversification persistent throughout time? 
uh, past, present, and future? Well, that's a that's a charged question with uh, uh, that uh, that introduces a number of difficulties uh, from a philosophical point of view, isn't it? Because um, uh, what you're asking is whether um, things that um, have uh, different parts, you know, are able to maintain identity in all those parts as time passes, you know, and that is, uh, that is a problem. And, and it's a problem in, in light of uh, what we know from physics, isn't it? There is, uh, we, not, we need to somehow uh, um, be compliant with, uh, with the, the laws of thermodynamics on one side, but also from a from a you know point of view of the origin of the universe with uh, uh, entropic forces, isn't it? That, uh, that what they do is basically produce all this stochastic noise uh, that uh, the messy systems, you know, for a, borrowing the the term that was used in a previous uh, seminar series, um, uh, and I think that is what causes sequences to for instance, to produce a lot of, uh, of noise and, and to also to produce a problem. And that is, as you were going back in time, uh, the reconstruction exercise becomes more and more difficult, isn't it? It's just a, a, a mathematical property there. So, um, so I would say, you know, tentatively that probably yes, um, throughout time, you will have diversification occurring at different levels, of course, of of whatever system you have at that time. I don't know if that just satisfied your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we will finish our seminar. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a question from Sharon. I will ask you to unmute. Oh, there's a team. Finally, the chat. Okay. Oh, we can hear you, Sharon, if you want to ask your question live. Sharon, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm gonna type it. Oh, you're gonna type it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and um, so we'll just give Sharon one moment. And um, yeah, if there are any other questions in the meantime, please feel free to raise your hand or type them in the chat. Okay, Sharon, I think that maybe we will answer your question in the Slack group, um, just so that we can kind of wrap things up. And uh, um, yeah, so I'm just gonna, I think I will just cut it <laughs> short. So um, the Slack group link is there and you can join that. And then um, any questions that you have will, you can you can post them there and then the speakers can answer them for you. Um, we will also take any unanswered questions from this Zoom chat and post them there so that uh, post seminar discussion can happen there. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to our three speakers for such wonderful talks and thank you to all of you for coming out today and attending the seminar and participating in the discussion. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you in three weeks. And again, if you have any suggestions for future uh, seminar topics, feel free to reach out um, either directly to one of the seminar co-organizers co or um, we can talk through chat or through the Slack group.
Great. So thank you so much. Thank you.